then we'll have spare gear as well. Uh, so we're going to be introducing Park Mobile okay. as, as our parking, uh, you know, app. Number one would be our smoke and carbon alarms. Hey, I'm here today with Paul Fuller, Chief Fuller, you may know him as. He's our Chief of the Fire Department. Actually, is that correct to say the Chief of the Fire chief Department? Chief of the Department, yeah. Okay, Chief, chief of the of Department. department. Yeah. So I'm, I'm here with Chief Fuller, and he's going to share with us uh, some latest news as it pertains to the Fire Department. Great. Well, well thanks for having me back. Sure. Um, new things going on is uh, we found out last week that we were awarded $75,000. Nice. That's going to go towards PPE, or we're going to use it towards turnout gear. Okay. Um, that's the structural turnout gear that we always wear on all of our calls. Um, big thing in, in the fire service is clean gear. Okay. You know, before it was the dirtier gear, the dirtier your helmet, you were a salty fireman. Yeah, you, know? yeah. you saw a lot of fire. <laughs> well, what we've been learning, especially since 9-11, is cancer is a leading cause of uh -huh. death in firefighters, even when they retire out of the service. So is that like from debris, things that might, particles that might be on the clothing or the gear? Or? It, it is, it okay. is. Uh, a lot of things. We've lost more firefighters now uh, from 9-11 than we did actually on September 11th. Wow. More have died from cancer and carcinogens that they've gotten in 9-11 or fighting fires. But like you said, it is, it's due to the smoke, uh, the, the toxins that are in the smoke now, everything in our house, this is all plastics right, and right. filled with lots of toxins, especially when it burns. Right. So right. Uh, after a fire, after an incident, we need to take that gear, put it out of service and get it professionally cleaned oh, to get wow. that out okay. there. Um, Issue is, though, we don't have gear to wear when that gear is out of service and being cleaned. Okay. So uh, we're going to get spare gear that we can, you know, we'll get new gear that we can always wear, and then we'll have spare gear as well. So, so we'll always have clean gear, we'll always be in service and ready to respond. Wow. So that's, uh, I bet that's something that most people have never considered, no, you know, no, what so, happens. No. And I know as uh, photographers, video gear, you know, we always want redundancy. We want to have extra equipment. If we need a camera, we want to have two, maybe even three mm -hmm. in case something happens. So I get it. It makes sense. So it's, that's definitely, that's nice to hear that you're getting some grant money to, absolutely to help then, out with that. You know, it, it, it takes that burden now off of the taxpayers and the city to try and pay for that gear. Okay, great, so great. It, it's a win-win all around. The taxpayers don't have to pay for it. We, the firemen, can be clean gear, and uh, hopefully, you know, even after they retire, they can live a long life and be less likely to develop cancers from, from the job. Yeah, yeah, protection, safety gear is so important, so important. Oh, absolutely. So is there anything else going on that we should know about? Um, well, that's been the big element right now. Uh, that was just last week. Um, there's other things that are developing, but nothing yet. So uh, maybe maybe next month we'll have more to report on that. Okay. All right. So it looks like that's the latest with Chief Fuller here for Brigantine, Brigantine Living, and the Brigantine Fire Department. Well, thanks, thanks Paul. Greg, I appreciate always you a pleasure. In. Always Absolutely. A pleasure. Take you. care.
I'm here with Tiger Platt, our city manager for Brigantine, and we have some interesting things coming to Brigantine this summer. Would you like to share that? Yeah, so uh, thanks for having me back. I, sure. I appreciate it. I think it's great what you guys are doing. Uh, so we're going to be introducing Park Mobile okay. as, as our parking uh, you know, app or program for our beach, municipal beach parking lots for the summer season. So how it's going to work is in the past, people would have to go down to our, our beach fee office and wait in line, buy a parking sticker, and then they would put the sticker in the rear against the back of the rear view mirror in their car, right. and then uh, they would go ahead and park. Very, very old school. Old school, right? <laughs> so what, what we're doing is we're trying to modernize things, right? Okay. Uh, so now uh, Park Mobile is coming to town. They are going to handle all of our beach parking lots for the summer season. So that'll be Memorial Day through Labor Day. And how it'll work now is you'll still have the same options you had before. So you have a seasonal option and then you have a daily parking option. So for seasonal, if, if you wanna buy a seasonal parking pass, again, before you went in, you got sticker. Now all you can do is you can go on Park Mobile's app. If you have the app on their phone, you can create an account for Brigantine and you know pay for the, uh, the, the parking sticker for the season. You register to your license plate on your vehicle and then that's all you do. You know, you pay for it and everything's great. Now, with the seasonal pass, you go to the beach, that's it, you just park in the lot, you don't have to do anything wow. else, you don't have to do anything that day. You don't have to your phone out, nope, find you're, your app. you're good, you bought the season pass, you're good for the whole season, that's it. It's pretty nice. For dailies, uh, they'll, there will be signs in each lot, so if somebody pulls up and they don't have the, park, the seasonal pass, they'll be able to, there's a QR code, there's uh, different information that will direct them to go into the app or go onto the Park Mobile website. Um, and I believe there's also gonna be like a, a phone number or something you can call to, you know, if, if somebody uh, is unable to do it through their phone, like okay. through an app. And then they would buy the daily pass. Again, register the license plate of the vehicle they're using, and then they're good for the day. And, and that, that's that. So um, for enforcement, our, our uh, parking enforcement, our police officers, uh, they will go through and everything's going to be through the license plate now so they can go through they can read their license plates and they'll be able to know whether or not that vehicle is paid up or if in fact they don't have a, a parking um, permit for the day so now they'll be able to go through and just read the license plates and um, right. and they'll be able to enforce parking that way so right, it's nice. you know we looked into this we've looked into other communities we talked to the other communities have been using it there, there's a lot of um, positives that we've heard from it. So we live here, so I didn't even realize that parking could become that much of an issue, yeah. you know? Is there a lot of places to pay for parking? Because I know you don't along the streets. No, so we're not gonna do anything along the streets. So the, the lots that will be affected, and these are the same exact lots that you needed a sticker, okay. you know, to park so at in the summer. Changed. So that hasn't changed. Okay. So we have the Roosevelt Boulevard lot, which is a smaller lot right at the end of Roosevelt right. Boulevard. We have the lot at 16th and 17th Street, Beach Patrol headquarters there. Right, okay. So we have that lot. We have 26th to 27th Street parking lot. We have the lot at 34th Street. Okay. And we also have a small lot at 38th Street near the entrance. All right. So we're, we're working toward modernizing a lot of things. Bring this into this century. Yeah, you know, I've heard a lot of people say how they'd still have to go and get their beach passes and sign and yeah. write a check. And so it's, yeah, a little, little step into the... Absolutely. Into the future. All right, so, uh, hey, Tiger, thanks for stopping in and filling us in. Brigantine, there you go. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. I went to Towson University for my Masters in Fine Arts in painting and printmaking. Well, welcome to Side Pony. Um, this is the storefront area um, that I've recently created because um, I, when I first got over here, I really needed more space. I wasn't actually looking for a storefront, but this was a, felt like a really good vibe over here. In the Orange Loop, lots of things are happening. Here today with Tim, 
from Sad Pony Print Shop, and we are going to learn all about print screens. So Tiff, I'm a small business owner along with my husband Craig, and we love making sure that we're representing our brand in the right way. So we always, you are our go-to girl. We come to you to get all of our stuff screen printed, we get patches made. So share with everyone what is the first step if they want to come to you and really have their brand stand out. So you have um, your design ready for me, which is lovely. Not everyone yeah. has that, which is fine. I can also take um, drawings and ideas and come up, work with people to come up with what they want. So can you create for them if they come to you with an idea? Can you draw that for them? Yes, for the most part, we can have a conversation, go back and forth about where we want to land with things and and work together on that. Yes, a lot of the work is done on the computer, okay. which then I can go in and divide up colors and see how we want them to look. So what got you into this world? I worked for a couple of different companies um, out of art school to uh, travel down different avenues of making art. This was one that actually got me a job so that I could keep doing that as well as making art. So um, there's a lot of moving parts to the screen printing. Some are the artistic, some are definitely the process. When you put them together, now I have my business based on, based on that. Did you find it hard to transition from, because I know that you paint, to go from the physical act of painting to now creating on a computer? Um, yes and no. So I think part of part of the screen printing process, which I'll show you, is um, repetition. So if you are creating a painting, you're doing one of. And with the screen print, you can make multiples of the same thing. So when you put them together, sometimes you have a whole other avenue of, yeah. of art. So. And that's got to be satisfying because then once you have it created, you can just you can change bang that design out. So exactly, or you can just print the same thing, which is where the, the business side comes from. Because people like uh, restaurants and events and things that are happening, they want the same thing so they can promote. Mm -hmm. So. And this is my first time in your new space, and it's amazing. I love how you've set it up. I know um, when I first met you, you were cranking stuff out of a garage in Brigantine. Yes. So high five to expanding and having this beautiful space. Well, thank you. All right, so let's um, let's do some screen printing. Okay, let's do it. All right. So once we have our films printed out, what's going to happen is we are going to line them up so that we can see that each color is definitely lined up in the printer. So from the computer to, to the film, and that's what's gonna end up coming out. We're gonna put color in each one of these. So now we are doing um, the burning of the screen. So what's happening is there's a light sensitive emulsion on the screen. Um, the stencil goes down, the screen goes on top, this machine um, exposes the screen with light to create the stencil, which then we're gonna wash out, and you're left with a negative. You're left with the stencil for the ink to go in. Okay, so once we have the stencil, all that process that we just did, pushing the ink through the stencil. So right now it's under the flash dryer, which is flashing some heat on the, um, on the ink so that I can lay another layer of white on top. Now, not only do you, you get to come in to potentially have some shirts made, um, you also can come in and find vintage clothing. It has a better vibe walking in, feeling like you're a part of something, while um, the actual work is being done right in front of you.
Welcome back to Brigantine Living Live. I'm here with Eduardo Jimenez, a local to Brigantine, and he's a local artist. And today we're going to talk to him about what he creates. Eduardo, how are you? Doing great, Craig. Thank you for having me here today. Oh, it's a pleasure. So uh, I, I hear you're doing something pretty wonderful here in Brigantine. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, well, I'll give you the top line is that I'm actually uh, walking every almost every day, uh, picking up trash and making art with the trash I collect. It all started during the pandemic because I needed to do some exercise because gyms were not available. Okay. So walking through the streets and the beach gave me that exercise that I needed and noticed all this trash on my path. So I decided to take a little plastic bag with me and start collecting trash. Nice. And it just, you know, then I got a grabber and then I got a cart and it has expanded into collecting different objects to create artworks. And uh, I do two things. One, I create a, what I call a pop-up art, okay. which is the, the daily collection becomes an installation in my garage. Okay. Take a picture, put it on Instagram to tell people about it. So do you try to put a, a picture a day or yes. a new piece every day? Pretty much. And then all of a sudden uh, there were local events like uh, the local uh, Brigantine Beach Cultural Arts okay. group start doing shows. So I start making permanent pieces to okay. showcase here. And they have gotten recognition, meaning people are liking it. So that's what I call it permanent art versus pop-up art. Okay. The pop-up art is basically I, I create the competition in the, in the floor. I then throw it all away. Sometimes I keep some pieces like the shotgun wads for further use. Okay. Uh, then the permanent pieces take more time and, and they're, they're a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. So speaking of your permanent art, mm -hmm. congratulations. I hear you have your first, is it a solo? It is a solo. Okay. Uh, it's still very surreal to me. So, so there are a total of 33 pieces at the gallery. And when, when is this exhibit so taking place? So the opening was uh, Janu uh, January 14th. Okay, so it's current. And uh, it's currently going, and it's going to end on February 24th. Uh, on February 24th, there will be an artist talk where I'm going to be there at the last day and having a discussion with people there about my art. And then something else that I haven't publicized yet, I agreed to do a workshop. And it's going to be a hands-on workshop where people are actually going to make a artwork out of trash. Okay. Specifically, we will be balloons. balloons. And this is uh, my demo that I've been actually do it myself. And right now, oh, the reasons nice. you see the pins yeah. is because okay. when I use the glue, I want to make sure the pieces stay on. Once it dry, the glue dries, I pull the pins out. So it's a... Uh, so we're gonna do a little wave in two hours. Okay. So everybody there. So, nice. Yep. And uh, you were telling us earlier a little bit about your balloon collection. So when I go walking on the beach, many times I find balloons. Today I actually found like five or six balloons. But when I find them, they're in this type of condition. But now, because I have now this partnership with this balloon mission organization, this newer balloons, here's the, this is a work in progress of a whale, which is all new balloons. These balloons were uh, used in celebrations, but then put in bins for proper disposal. Okay. And my balloon mission, the name is uh, Cynthia Siebel, who runs it, sent this to me because I requested the balloons because the color is vibrant. Yes. So now I could use the balloons in the actual main composition instead of just the background. The sad thing is that animals in the ocean believe this is food. Right. And they know, eat it and chew curls, it. And, exactly. And they could choke it. So these are very damaging. I also learned if you release this in the cities because of the metallic surface, they could spark and cause fires. Wow. So that's another reason not to let them out. So Eduardo, where could one purchase some of your artwork? Well, um, my artwork could be purchased or acquired. Um, some of it is uh, posted or displayed at a local store called Island Items. Okay. Uh, or you can contact me directly through Instagram at Eduardo J9 uh, or Eduardo J9 Art. Okay. And um, Eduardo J9 Art, most of the permanent art is listed there and showcased. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you for being with us today. It was great to learn about what you're doing, keeping our beaches clean here in Brigantine. And uh, we will link Eduardo's information in the comments below, as well as on our blog post. So if you want to follow him, definitely go and check him out. I've been on his Instagram. Uh, he's got some pretty amazing work. Uh, you, you'll probably find something you might like to put in a little space in your home. So until we see you combing the beaches, take care, and that's it for now. All right, I'm here today with Jack Murray. He is our, what would you say your official role is? Fire official. Fire, he's a fire official that would be in charge of inspections of your home or your businesses. And today we're gonna to talk about the top three overlooked items that people should be aware of for inspections. Right. What are they? Okay, so we get asked this question a lot. The com most common violations, number one would be our smoke and carbon alarms. A lot of times people don't realize that we look to see when your house was built prior to us entering and conducting the inspection and we'll pass that on to the inspector because if it's 1978 or before, it would be okay to have a 10 year sealed battery smoke detector that is just a single station, it's not connected to anything. But ultimately what we'd like is for everyone to have hardwired interconnected because that makes everyone more safe. If there's a fire in the kitchen, it would notify the second floor if there's a second floor. So we would ultimately want hardwired interconnected. It's interesting because I was unaware that when you have hardwired systems like that, that they communicate to each other. I never knew that. I just figured they were hardwired for, so you wouldn't need a battery. I didn't realize they would then communicate if one goes off in the hallway it's gonna go off in the upstairs bedroom. So that's right. good to know. So that's something that is overlooked by a lot of homeowners. Right. So then the next thing would be carbon monoxide. Yeah, carbon monoxide, same thing. If there's any kind of gas or fuel fired appliances in the home, a fireplace or, or a garage or natural gas stove or natural gas heating, hot water heater or anything like that, you would wanna know that those appliances are working efficiently and you would wanna have a operating carbon monoxide alarm. And right, because some of those are odorless, right? So right. you're not gonna smell it. Exactly, It's the, they call that the silent killer. Right. And, and this way, if there's any kind of carbon and it goes off, you'll be able to dial 911, have us get the detector in there. A lot of times we'll call the gas company if it's a an appliance that's malfunctioning or something like that. So it's important to have them if you have fuel fired or gas, natural gas appliances in your house. So what would be the next thing on your list? The next thing is in 2022, the state of New Jersey passed a liability insurance law. 
So if you're renting property in the state of New Jersey, they want them to have a minimum of $500,000 liability insurance. And they're supposed to submit it to the local unit, which would be us, prior to renting the property. Okay. So that is often another thing that uh, something, you know, that would fail during inspection was they, they wouldn't have, it either wouldn't have the insurance or didn't know that the state passed the law. So we would want that, that, that's a very common thing right now. This pertains more towards somebody who's, it's a rental property? Right. So not an owner occupant? No, owner occupied, okay. and, and actually none of these would be applied to owner occupied okay. because we wouldn't be inspecting your home. Really everything that we do in our office pertains to rental property okay. or commercial property. Gotcha. The third thing would be openable windows. So a lot of times it, it'll get painted over or over the years the window will get stuck. And if there are new renters, the window, for whatever reason, won't work. So that's the third most common sighted thing is openable when if it's not a fixed window where it's got a latch you can slide it up it's got all the things that and it's got to work so yes. if you're renting a property or you have a commercial business that has windows that should open mm -hmm. um, before you schedule your inspection it might be a good idea to go around and make sure they all function well right, right? so that's your top three items all right so Keep that in mind, uh, rental properties, businesses, uh, check these things out. All right. All right, well, Jack, thanks for stopping by. No problem. We appreciate it. Appreciate and uh, it. if anybody has questions pertaining to any of this, where would they? You could call the fire department, but also the fire prevention unit is 609-266-3102 or email us at fireprevention at brigantinebeachnj.com. All right, thank you. Well, there All you right. have it. Thank you. That's it, folks. Take care.